Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. There are still more participants uh, joining, so we'll just wait one more minute to give everyone the chance to join. We'll, we'll start in a second. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I think we are ready to start. So welcome to our webinar on labor market integration, promoting the employment of refugees in Europe. We're very pleased to see so many of you could join us. I see over 86 participants and more continue to join. So welcome, everyone. We're looking forward to having an interesting discussion with all of you. Let me first uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Geertra Lanou, and I work at the IOM regional office in Brussels, where I'm responsible for uh, migrant integration and labor uh, mobility. Um, I will be hosting the webinar today. I'll be your moderator, but we also have other speakers and colleagues uh, with you that are going to share their experience on how we can promote employment of refugees in Europe. Perhaps we can look together at the program that we have for you today. Um, first of all, we have um, Talent Beyond Boundaries, uh, Marina Brizar, who's the UK director, and she will tell us about skilled migration pathways for refugees. Um, skilled migration pathways also in the sense of complementary pathways to resettlement, but Marina will explain us a bit more what is this as a complementary pathway and how we can offer uh, employment opportunities in Europe to skilled uh, refugees. Secondly, we are going to look at the role of the private sector, because of course we can't talk about the labour market integration of refugees without also looking at what is the role the private sector can play into that and how to render the labour market more inclusive. And for that, we're very happy to have with us uh, Francesco Reale, uh, Secretary General uh, ADECO, and Monia Dardi, Scientific Coordinator and International Affairs Projects, uh, both from the ADECO Foundation. Actually, ADECO is also one of our partners um, under the COMMIT project. And then finally, we're also very happy today to launch uh, our new publication, uh, Guidelines on Labour Market Integration of Resettled Refugees in the EU. Uh, it's a set of practical guidelines for practitioners who support resettled refugees in their uh, labour market integration. And Anna Giustiniani, who's the Commit uh, Project Manager at our office in Rome, will be presenting uh, to you this new publication. So you're the first ones uh, to find out uh, about this. And I'm also pleased to see that by now we have 100 participants on board. So thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar is actually organized under the COMMIT uh, project. And COMMIT is an EU-funded uh, project. It's actually funded under the Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund of the European Union. And this project aims to increase both pre-departure and post-arrival support for um, the integration of persons in need of international protection who are being resettled uh, to the EU. So we are really looking at how to support the integration of refugees that come through resettlement programs. The project particularly looks at Croatia, Italy, Portugal, 
and Spain. It's the countries you see here in orange on the map. But of course, many of the practices of the guidelines of the publications are of relevance uh, to all of us, also those who work on the settlement in other EU countries. Um, so if we can perhaps move to the next slide, we'll see uh, a bit more information about uh, the objectives of this commit uh, project. Um, generally, what we aim to do with commit is strengthening the linkages between pre-departure and post-arrival support for resettled refugees, with a specific focus on young refugees, on youth, and on women. Um, those who have attended some of our previous commit webinars might know that, for example, we focused a lot on pre-departure orientation for refugee youth. We also launched a youth curriculum uh, for that, a training curriculum. Um, we also worked a lot on gender and how to strengthen, for example, gender uh, elements in pre-departure orientation. Um, finally, we also work on issues that link to um, psychosocial support uh, across the resettlement continuum. And there is actually an upcoming publication on that as well. So as you will see here, the work of COMMIT uh, spans from enhancing pre-departure orientation, addressing specific needs also of youth, uh, of women, uh, systemizing also community support in the receiving communities through, for example, building capacities of local actors or piloting mentorship schemes. And then, of course, fostering the exchange among the settlement countries to uh, identify also best practices and, and share experiences and the webinar uh, today would serve that purpose. So with many thanks, of course, to the European Union for supporting this uh, commit project. We are happy that uh, it allows us to have our webinar today focusing on labour market integration of refugees. Before we start with our first session, uh, we're actually curious to know who is in the room? I see by now 127 participants. And of course, we're wondering, uh, are you working on supporting refugees, uh, labor market integration? And if so, are you working at the European level? Perhaps you know, you're more in the policy making, perhaps you're working at the national level, or perhaps you're working at a local level, maybe in a reception center directly assisting refugees. Uh, so we have a small poll for you that you will see uh, with a question addressed uh, to you. On which level do you support the labor market integration of refugees? Is it at European level, at national level or at local level? Or perhaps you're not directly engaged in this area, but interested Then you can tick option D. So please tick one answer. You have um, a few seconds left. Please click A, B, C, or D, so we'll get a better sense of uh, who is there. If all should go well, I think that soon we will also see the results of the poll. Yes. Okay. I see here that the biggest uh, group amongst us is actually working at a local level. Many of you also work at the national level, some at European level, and some of you are not directly engaged in labor market integration, but happy to hear more. So good to see that we have this interesting mix of participants of us. Thank you for participating in the poll. I think this week we can move to our presentation. And for this first presentation, we're very happy to welcome uh, Marina Brizar from Talent Beyond Boundaries. Marina Brizar is the UK Director of Talent Beyond Boundaries, and uh, she will tell us a bit more about skilled migration pathways for refugees. What are some of the challenges there and how can we support refugees in finding uh, jobs in Europe? Marina, very pleased to have you here in our webinar. Over to you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, calling in from London and, and wishing you all a lovely day. The sun is shining here and I hope spring is coming for you all. So as Gertra um, said, my name is uh, Marina Brizar and I'm the UK Director of Talent Beyond Boundaries. If we can move to the next slide, please. Fantastic. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, displaced talent mobility, which is a variation of labor, labor, labor market integration. 
which really brings people out of displacement in countries where they are currently displaced into receiving countries. And for TBB, um, our, our broad program is now looking at um, the European Union and, and countries in Europe as the next frontier. And that's why we have a very strong partnership with IOM and, and it is a real honor to be here today. But I thought I'd start with my personal story to start tying in this idea of the importance of labor market integration, but also to bring together some of the players that are on this call, including states, but also um, organizations. So if we can move to the next slide. So I um, was born in Sarajevo, in um, Bosnia, um, a few years before the war. Um, when the war happened, um, my family were separated. Some stayed in Sarajevo. Um, my mum and brothers and I um, moved uh, through different camps and, and I basically was raised in a refugee camp in Croatia, um, given that I do have a Croatian origin through my dad's side of the family. Um, I think it's important to set this scene because um, the way that my family and I moved from that refugee setting to resettlement in Australia, you might pick up the accent, was through UNHCR's program and it was actually IOM that moved us to Australia. So we have the IOM luggage and with the IOM bags and, and you know, people in the vest taking us through. So it's a real honour and a privilege to be able to now talk about how we can give back and how important labour market integration is. Now, the real story here is that my father was a telecommunications engineer, my mum was a supply chain expert. Um, and within six months of arriving to Australia through really um, sophisticated programming in terms of language support, CV support, interview support, um, soft skill preparation, my dad became a, a telecommunications engineer at Vodafone, um, the, the, uh, the telephone company, and my mum started cross-qualifying her economics degree in an Australian context. She then started working in supply chain in her industry about two years after arrival. And so the message was the way that we became um, sort of independent, self-sufficient, empowered was through work, even though we had protection. Now, because of this, my family have always sort of said, in fact, my dad said when I was a child, I wish that I found a job to get out of the war before I had to rely on my protection needs to get out. And that really is TBB's story. And so if we can move to the next slide, um, Talent Beyond Boundaries exists to, to basically lift um, people who are skilled and to have experience, qualifications, language um, abilities from countries like Lebanon and Jordan into destination countries where there are skill shortages. So it literally is matching a talent pool of people with skills with skill shortages in other countries. So our mission is um, and, our, and our vision is um, a world where forcibly displaced people can use their skills to move to secure futures. Now, in doing this, we've learned a lot of lessons about the different players, different principles and, and challenges and, and, and lessons. And so that's what I'll, I'll speak to you about today. But also in doing that, share a little bit more about how TBB work. So if we can move to the next slide. Now, this is um, a perfect image to demonstrate the importance of the private sector in actually being part of this solution. So I know that my colleagues at ADECO are going to talk about the role of the private sector, but I just wanted to share with you this image. The gentleman in the black shirt is the CEO of a software company called Iris, which is a multinational, multi-million dollar um, organization. They recruited people from Lebanon and Jordan um, with a refugee background, so three Syrians, to Sydney, Melbourne and Cheltenham in the UK as software engineers. Andrew's approach, so Andrew Walsh in, in the black shirt, is that there are people who are struggling but are skilled. I'm struggling in a different way and I have a skill shortage. 
I just need to match them. So what do I need to do to enhance my processes to make sure that I can open up opportunities to people who, who may not be as visible and as accessible as local or traditional um, talent sources? Now, the gentleman in the purple shirt is a um, man by the name of Tarak. So Tarak was uh, TBB's first arrival in Australia. Um, TBB now work in Australia, Canada and uh, the UK. As I say, the European Union is, is our next frontier. But Tarek arrived, you know, as, as a young man who was very eager to learn through, you know, community led welcome through um, basic induction. He started work within a number of uh, weeks. He's now um, flourishing at work. He's looking at a promotion pipeline. In the meantime, got um, married and genuinely owned a better car than me in Australia. And so the message again is that the private sector can be part of this solution, but this solution is not necessarily charity. It's not a matter of, oh, there are people who we need to give jobs to. It's a matter of having a competitive recruitment process to see where skilled people can fit, fit your skill shortages. And if it is done correctly, it is a win-win for, for everyone involved. So if we go to the next slide, the win-win really is, is um, typified in, in this um, graph. So I know there's a lot of information here, but I'll, I'll just talk through it. So the, um, the, the center of TBB's work is what we call a talent catalog. So it is a world first uh, software and database that really starts to categorize, to pull, to understand what skills and talents candidates have um, in displacement. So as I say, our source countries are Lebanon and Jordan um, for the time being. We are looking at expanding to other um, countries and regions. But we now have over 25,000 people registered on the talent catalog. They represent 151 occupations, almost 20% of registrants are female, and almost 70% of registrants have at least a bachelor's degree. So the idea behind the talent catalogue is to allow candidates to present themselves and to, to, to become visible to employers. But on the other side, for TBB and our partners, to start matching those candidates with employers based on, um, you know, specific employer led need. So the talent catalog really is such a fascinating way in which to understand, you know, what what skills are out there. And, and I mean, we've placed everything from butchers to management consultants, from legal assistants to software engineers, um, doctors, nurses, and so on. So you know, if, if we think about what happens in displacement, it's sometimes that entire societies are lifted out and have to move. And so it, it, it's um, it's important to recognize that 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 was a working livable society and people had skills and contributions to that society and now need a second chance. And that's where employers play a really important part. So if we can go to the next slide. So these are the guiding principles of TBB's work as an organization, but they're also principles which we try to pass on to our employment partners, but also other um, partners in our network, including recruiters, refugee serving organizations and so on. So when we work on, on partnerships on proposals, we make sure that our principles are aligned. Now I can go into a lot of detail, but I think some of these are self-explanatory, so I'll touch on them very briefly. So the first principle is that um, labor market integration, um, displaced talent mobility, whether it's for people coming from overseas into a country, sponsored by an employer or whether it's for people and refugees already in country has to be employer led in that the employer must have the ability to choose the candidates that will fit their values the skill shortage that is vacant um, and skill sets have to align so we see a real importance in the employers having um, the ability to to um, recruit candidates as they would in any other market participation. So it has to be demand driven. The second um, principle is one of autonomy and empowerment, and that is of the displaced person or the refugee. So 
you know, this, when we talk about labour market integration, it's not a matter of hand holding the whole way. It's not a matter of giving necessarily too much more than you would to other skilled participants. It is about leveling the playing field. So identifying bespoke needs and making sure that they don't disadvantage someone, but always giving candidates the autonomy, the empowerment to make their own decisions, to, to do their own courses, to improve language with, with courses that are um, created for them and so on. So it really is looking um, at, at how to make that person empowered to, to create opportunities for themselves. That sort of leads on to the next um, aspect, which is equitable access. From TBB, our mission is to create a pathway to create equitable access for candidates. But from an employment perspective, an employer perspective, equitable access may be things like understanding that if you are going to hire a refugee internationally or already in country, there may be extra steps that need to be taken to have them part of the workforce, whether they be, you know, um, visa requirements, immigration requirements, whether they be, um, you know, pre-employment checks or whatever the case may be. The message is that um, sometimes policies have to change in order to create equitable access. So we're not talking about equal access so that everyone gets the same. We're talking about equitable access where sometimes there is a bigger lift for people who are from a refugee or displaced background. Of course, and it goes without saying, needs to have refugee centered design. It goes to this issue of autonomy and empowerment. From TBB's perspective, we have a board of alumni who, who guide us on, on our strategic decision making and make recommendations to our program to make sure that we understand who um, are the beneficiaries and that they are the centre of our work. For TBB, again, additionality and complementarity. So this, we're actually creating a new pathway for people to be able to be lifted out of displacement. This does not replace, it does not um, take the place of refugee resettlement that every country must continue to do and, and in fact increase. It is about creating a second pathway, a complementary pathway that will suit some people who are in displacement, but not all. So even though um, most people in displacement have protection needs, some can go down this labour pathway with the support of employers. Finally, there is protection as, as a guiding principle. So understanding that um, candidates that come and work at your organisation sometimes do not have the option of returning to their home country. Um, they may have um, underlying issues like torture and trauma and so on. So looking at the integration to support that, um, but also keeping in mind that candidates need to um, have a durable solution through immigration and so on um, is a really important aspect of our work and, and a journey we take employers on. So if we can go to the next slide. So I'll just speak a little bit about what TBB do. There are a lot of steps and you'll see that different partners are part of the steps, but really this is to, to showcase what an employer-led approach means. So in the first instance, we have um, step A and B. So corporate outreach is the outreach to employers in countries. So, you know, Australia, Canada, the UK and Europe. Um, a candidate outreach is getting more people onto the talent catalogue from Lebanon and Jordan. What then happens is an employer will say, OK, here is my skill shortage. Do you have any talent to match? We then do a candidate identification. We intake candidates to make sure that they are people who are in need of international protection. We do a review of their CV and submit it to the employer. The employer then says, OK, of this of these 10 interview of these 10 CVs, I'm interested in interviewing these five candidates. The employer then goes through a competitive remote recruitment, um, skills validation, pre-employment checks and so on that TBB and, and partners support. If the employer is then happy with the, with the, with the candidate, they go to um, the job offer and inf inform decision making. So the employer will say, okay, here's a job offer. This is where we'd like you to work and what we'd like you to do. Here's your salary, where you're going to be working, etc. That is then explained to the candidate relative to where they're going. 
So the people that we work with, for example, um, over 90% of them are living illegally in Lebanon and Jordan, which means they don't have access to bank accounts, very rarely have access to work rights, um, they work illegally. And so going from earning 400 US dollars a um, a month to getting, you know, 40,000 euro is a huge jump, but we, we have to make sure that candidates understand what that means relative to their destination. In some cases, candidates have said no um, to, to job offers for, for a, a range of reasons, and that's where the empowerment element is really important. Um, but it's a really, um, it, that becomes a really commercial decision then for both the employer and, and the candidate. And, and that goes to equitable access and, and really normalizing this as a pathway. So if we can go to the next step. So um, for TBB's international program, step six is about visa preparation and lodgement. So in all countries that we work, we use um, visa systems that already exist and work with governments to make them more accessible. So in the UK, for example, we use the skilled visa route. Um, so in, for, for people who are already in country, that step is not necessarily required, but there might be like employment um, and, and immigration checks there. While the visa is being processed and decided, we then work on settlement planning. And that's everything from uh, pre-departure orientation that, that we're working with IOM on to um, you know, identifying community-led groups, identifying the needs of those people moving, so education, job aspirations, et cetera, to make sure that once they land, there is a bit of a pathway a plan for, for how they will integrate it and be part of the community so it's one thing to have a job that that's a livelihood secured but if someone's moving with family the most empowered person then leaves that family home leaving perhaps spouse and children to to integrate in their own way and so finding ways in which to support that is really important the step eight is is really again from TVB's perspective a practical thing of getting someone from A to B, so getting someone from Lebanon and Jordan into their destination country. Um, again, that that requires health checks, flights, you know, arrival at airports, and so on, which goes to step nine, and that's the arrival and initial orientation, and starting to monitor what the settlement plan looks like in reality. Um, I will say that the best thing about my job at TVB is welcoming people at the airport with signs and everything. So um, we often have employers join us on that um, and, and welcome candidates in, into their country. It really is a highlight. So finally, once everything is on track, candidates start working, the resettlement plans rolling out, people are in school learning the language, etc. We then have the post-placement monitoring. So to make sure that both the candidate and the employer um, are having their expectations met and they're, they're traveling in the same direction and, and towards a durable solution um, that, that is mutually beneficial for everyone involved. So steps, I guess, six to 10 really require employers to start thinking about partners to, to bring on and, and perhaps creating quite unique um, scenarios. So we work, for example, with Accenture as an employment partner, and you know we introduced Accenture to the Red Cross and said they're going to help with the settlement. It's often, it's not a relationship that Accenture was, was used to, but it is about creating the, this ecosystem to make um, refugee resettlement work. It is not the employer's responsibility to make sure that every single aspect of integration is um, is is taken care of. The employer needs to be a facilitator and, and can be as involved or not involved as, as they can or need to be. So that's really important to understand where your limits, your resources and, and your um, sort of strengths are in terms of how to integrate candidates both in the workplace, which is often very strong for employers with onboarding, but into the community. And that's where it could be an arm's length sort of um, decision making process. So if we can go to the next slide. I share this quote on almost every presentation I do. So this is Halef. He is the software engineer uh, based in Cheltenham in the UK. 
And the reflection that he has on being given a job to be lifted out of um, displacement is it's like someone is in a deep well and you throw a rope for him. So what I am really passionate about is the fact that this seems like such a logical solution and it is in an employer's sort of possibility and realm to be part of such a dramatic humanitarian solution that lasts generations. So it's not simply about, um, you know, donating money, which is very important. It's not simply about, you know, raising awareness. This labour market integration on whatever level that is, um, whatever level is available to the employer is really walking the walk. Um, when Iris, um, when Iris um, actually introduced um, Halif, uh, Tariq and Dara in Australia and the UK, um, the, the hashtag um, one Iris started trending on Twitter globally. So Iris is not a huge company, but it started trending because, um, you know, employees were so proud of what their company had done. And as, as TVB, as enablers of this, it is really very um, encouraging that it's a, it's a solution that benefits not only the market in terms of a skill shortage being filled, not only the individual and their family who are moved, but the community who wrap around them and actually see that through empowerment, through you know, leveraging opportunities and systems and processes that already exist, we can create an equitable solution that should be available to more people. And that is really driven by employers in the private sector. So um, I'm very passionate about it, if you haven't heard already. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go to the next slide, please. And this is my last slide. Um, so really, this is th these are just some key learnings and some takeaways for, for employers, for partners, for anyone who sort of works in this area to, to start thinking about. So the first thing is um, a challenge against assumptions and presumptions. So refugee is a word that uh, you know describes a group of people, but really it describes a circumstance. It doesn't describe the individual. So it is really important to consider the human. So it's not about um, a, a refugee program. It's a program for X person. Um, there is a tendency for um, refugee programs to be um, framed as graduate programs or return to work programs or something, which in many cases, particularly those who are in country, is the right approach. But for those, for example, who are in Lebanon and Jordan, who are working, who have maintained their skills, for them to go as um, a mechanical engineer with 20 years of experience to a graduate program is not the right fit. So it really is challenging the assumptions and presumptions of what is right and including the candidate in decision making and really understanding the individual who's the beneficiary or the group of individuals who are beneficiaries to then see where, where the best fit is. Because if everything fits right, it's the best outcome for everyone. So the second thing is I, I speak very much about empowerment and skills and this being like a, a, a very commercially driven requirement uh, program, which it is a very important part. But what's equally important is acknowledging displacement. So even the most impressive candidates have experienced and been impacted by displacement. So this may this may translate to challenges in a practical perspective, like being able to present documents um, or, um, you know, even obtain passports and things like that. So tweaking um, uh, employment, um, validity checks, um, skills recognitions and so on to to make sure that the skills are demonstrated, but maybe not in, in the most standard way. So an example is with software engineers, instead of having to prove that you have three years of experience when you've worked illegally and no one will sign you off, um, we've had employers develop coding tests to be satisfied that a person who sat this test and achieved a distinction is apt in coding. For butchers, I've literally seen videos 
of an animal being slaughtered to demonstrate that they have the skills of a butcher, even though they don't have a certificate to show for it. So, so looking at, at those impacts of displacement, but then also in terms of the integration and resettlement, acknowledging things like torture and trauma, acknowledging that there may be time, there may be a lead up time for candidates to be more comfortable to, to participate in group scenarios for their voice to be heard and so on. So making sure that the reception, the integration orientation on boarding is um, acknowledging the, the background from which these people come. The third lesson is it takes a community. As I said, there is no expectation that employers have to do every single piece of the puzzle. And the strength really comes from being able to delegate and to share responsibilities with people who are experts in their different um, in their different sort of areas. So, for example, one partner could be a recruitment partner who helps with these, um, you know, flexible pre-employment checks. Once they arrive, perhaps working with a community group, um, a, a church group, a, um, a resettlement organisation like the Red Cross to make sure that candidates are resettled, English language providers, universities, schools, and really creating an ecosystem so that the resource lift is not on the employer to make sure that someone is there to take the child to school for the first day, but it is to, to have an oversight to say, okay, this is a complete end-to-end -end package. So it really does take a collaborative community approach. And then the final thing that I'll note um, is really philosophical, um, but something to consider when, when developing programs around this. And that is the disparity between time, power and responsibility, at least for, from candidates from the Middle East. So in the UK, if you say you're going to be somewhere at 11, you're there at five minutes to 11. So timing is very important, whereas our candidates have a much more laissez-faire approach where time is indicative, not, not set. And so, um, you know, training and, and understanding that. The second thing is power dynamics. So in many cases, what we find is that candidates are so grateful that their employer has done this for them. There, there becomes a power imbalance, which is not necessarily um, aligned with values of organizations or, or whatever or, or because they've dealt with one person in the organization they they dedicate so much energy to that person that partner that you know um and so looking at power dynamics and even in the way that it's spoken so instead of using someone's first name which might be normal using a formal name for them in public um, is something that just needs to be adapted and then finally, levels of responsibility. So again, people coming out of displacement have, have been disempowered and they don't have ultimate, in many cases, responsibility for, for the work that they do for their deadlines and things like that. So making sure that, um, you know, these soft skills are um, included in pre-departure orientations, but also that they're nurtured pre-employment and throughout employment by the employer. Um, I think they're, they're the sort of three pillars that, that need the most work. So final slide, um, I am again very pleased to have had the opportunity to, to share some of these thoughts with you um, and, and to see sort of the, the, the momentum that um, refugee labour market integration is having in Europe is, is really encouraging. Um, my details are on there, I'm, I'm happy to have conversations um, uh, if 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 there is a need for that, but thank you very much to IOM, one of our strongest partners. In fact, um, IOM and TVB, together with other partners, including Fragment, have um, worked together on a proposal to to open labour market mobility in into Europe through um, the European Commission. So we we are hoping for an for a positive outcome so that we can have a more tailored approach for for different countries to adapt this. But for now, I'll leave it there and thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Marina. It, it's really encouraging to see your enthusiasm and indeed, you know, to see how a win-win solution is actually possible. Um, I encourage all participants who have a question to ask the question in the chat. 
I see there are actually already a few questions uh, coming in, which is great. If you also have a question, you can use the chat and send your question to all panelists. Now, um, Marina, I really like the fact that you've put so much this focus on empowerment and how employment can also empower um, refugees and that we shouldn't, you know, look at refugees as just refugees. These are people who bring uh, skills. So it's, it's very, very nice to see that. Um, and also, of course, um, I think you very well explained uh, the guiding principle also that a labor mobility pathway to bring refugees uh, who are, for example, in countries of first asylum like Lebanon and Jordan should always be complementary to resettlement. It could never replace resettlement, but it's something in addition to. Uh, and the lessons learned that you explain the importance of the soft skills, for example, I think this this goes actually for for all uh, labor market integration of, of uh, refugees and, and the very useful lessons indeed for us uh, to keep in mind and also keep in mind for the pre departure orientation under, for example, uh, resettlement um, programs. So I see there are a few questions in the chat. I would like to ask your first question from uh, Fasun Akok from Turkey, um, who asks, uh, sorry, I have to scroll up again because more questions come in. <laughs> How do you see the role of career guidance with a holistic perspective to contribute to the total well-being of the individual or the refugee in this process? Great question. The role of career guidance. <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, Faizun, lovely to hear from you. Hello in Turkey. Um, I will say that is also our next frontier from a source perspective. So, hopefully, we will um, meet someday. But in terms of um, in terms of career guidance, really important because different different careers, different industries don't match from what candidates know in their home country to what it is in in their destination country. One typical example is nursing or healthcare. So in the UK, we're working on pilots to bring nurses into the UK, into the NHS. And one of the key things that we have as part of building those programs is developing career guidance so that people know that they might enter at a pre-qualification stage. But you know, if in six months they achieve a language require a language test of this, and if they um, complete this practical test, then in twelve months' time they will be registered nurses being paid this. So I think it is important to say, okay, this is what your experience was. This is how it translates to the country that you're going, and this is your pathway to progression. Again, this is really an empowerment model. Some candidates might be happy to say, look, I'm happy to be a nursing assistant and just settle in this country and feel safe for a few years and then I'll move on. Others sort of say, I want to be a registered nurse tomorrow. How do I get there? So I think that career guidance is really important. And again, it, it gives people focus on, on where they're heading, not necessarily where they've been, which is sometimes the case with protection outcomes. So a really important thing to, to manage expectations for both employers and candidates before they leave, but always keep them on track with that journey. So it's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question, Marina, is actually about uh, documents. So it's mm -hmm. possible that candidates might not have uh, their school diplomas or other documents uh, that are relevant to the employers uh, with them. Um, how, how do you address that issue? And, and, you know, does that sometimes create a problem for, for example, work permit requests or others? Absolutely, it does. And really, that's why TBB exists. So we're not a recruiter for the Middle East. <laughs> There's a temptation to just be like, let's place as many people as possible and, and do all that sort of stuff. For, for TBB, all we're trying to do is open the pathways for, for you know, barriers like not having documents to be um, streamlined. So what we do is actually uh, government advocacy to say, okay, what's your work visa permit process? Right, you require a degree. OK, government, instead of a degree, can an employer who has done a coding test and is sure this person is going to fit the job, wants to give them a contract, wants to pay them, can they undertake that this person has the right skill? Like, do we have to be bound by this particular document? Is there a more flexible approach? And so in all countries that we've dealt um, in Australia, in uh, the UK and in Canada, we have found alternatives to documents. In saying all that, 
in many cases, there are candidates who are fully documented. As skilled professionals, doctors, nurses, engineers, skilled tradespeople who have worked hard to obtain a certificate, they carry that as they carry their passport. They see that as a defining sort of characteristic of their of their being, so they have those documents. And then the challenge is really converting what they've done in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Yemen, Iraq to, to their destination country. So the key is flexibility. Um, in approach for both employers in terms of the recruitment and pre-employment checks, but also from a, an institutional point of view, and that's where advocacy comes in. But I will say advocacy is a million times easier if you have an employer in the room. If an employer says, look, this is a person I want to hire and I'm going to pay their salary at X rate, I can't find anything else. It's really hard for policymakers to say, oh, no, that can't work because they don't have a document. So. You know, this is employers very often are our partners in advocacy to government because it gives awareness to government that, you know, skilled employ skilled migration pathways are for the employer's benefit, but the employers aren't benefiting from this. And so it really um, introduces another voice to, to policymakers, and we think that's really important. Marina, we, we have a few more questions for you. Um, I'll, I'll perhaps combine two questions questions here. Uh, the first one is, uh, are you only working with Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan or also refugees from other countries? Which countries and companies are part of TBB? Mm -hmm. And then the next question is, uh, how long the post general leaks until someone can start working in the UK or uh, Australia? And also, how uh, are these? Uh, how how is this funded? Actually, this this program or the transfer. Great, great question. So first, no, we do not only work with Syrians. Syrians geographically make up the mo the the biggest population, but we do work with Iraqis, with Yemenis, with uh, Palestinians, with people who are stateless. So at the moment, because of resources, we are based only in Lebanon and Jordan. But as I say, our next frontiers are in Turkey, um, in Colombia, in, in Kenya, that's sort of our five year plan. So it was just because um, we sort of started in 2016 and the talent catalog was founded by a Barack Obama State Department funding. And so that's sort of where we are and it's consequential, but it's by no means limited to, to Syrian refugees. It's to talent and displaced people. How are we funded philanthropically? So we are funded by foundations, by innovation funds, by governments, by employers, by partners. So our funding model is really diverse. So for example, we are funded by the Department of Health and Social Care in the UK to bring nurses, but we also have recruitment partners in the UK where on placing someone, they, they donate part of their placement and recruitment fee back to TBB on a quarterly basis to keep the resources going. So we are fully philanthropically funded because our mission is to change the system, not, not only recruitment. So we're not here for, for um, profit. It really is using the placements as a way to demonstrate obstacles and, and to cure them. Um, what was the, How what long was does the process question? take until process someone... Take? Great, yeah. So look, typically in the UK, the process takes about two to three months. So an employer will put a position forward. We take two to three weeks to shortlist candidates. The candidate then goes through the um, recruitment process with the employer. Our record at the moment is seven interviews. We've had someone go through seven separate interviews for one job and, and he got it, fantastic. But you know that recruitment process depends on um, the employer. The visa sometimes ta often takes the longest amount of time because you have to collect all the documents and so on. Um, but in the UK, for example, we are afforded priority processing for our candidate. And so processing takes, you know, it could be a matter of days, but typically about two weeks. And then mobility candidates, because once they're given the offer to getting the visa is about, you know, a month, a month and a half. Once they get the visa, they're pretty much ready to go. So it's a matter of booking flights, pre-departure and things like that. So optimistically, we say two to three months. 
I think realistically, we sort of say six months from an opportunity being presented to a candidate landing in country. Um, different in Australia. Mm -hmm. I am an Australian and I cannot go back to Australia um, with, with their borders closed. So in this time of COVID, it's very different in Australia. It, it takes much longer. Um, but yeah, typically um, it, it, is, it is like any other international recruitment. And that's where we work very hard to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marina. Maybe a last point also on the on the funding on who pays for the transfer of the refugees. It's important also to highlight that employers here have have a key role, and employers are of course also expected to to pay. So TBB as well as IOM, we we operate according to the employer pays uh, principle. It should by no means be the refugee who's uh, expected to to pay for the costs of of the recruitment or or the transfer. Um, Marina, I, I see we have to move on looking on time, but there was a last question. If you could just answer in, in one second, the last question, <laughs> what are the most common skills or fields of work offered and requested on the platform? Yeah, thank you so much, Gertra, for, for making that point about employers paying. We expect employers to pay what they would for international recruitment plus some resettlement. So, um, you know, it is the beneficiary as well as the um, the the beneficiary being the employer. Um, what skills? There are 151 occupations on the talent catalogue, literally range, ranging from anthropologists to surgeons. So there, there is no, I mean, the most transferable skills are technical skills. So data analysts, software engineers, um, mechanical civil engineers, and so on. They're the most transferable skills, but we are working, as I say, with healthcare, with teachers, um, with skilled trades people and so on. So really there is an entire society and an entire talent pool that is ready to go. Okay, great. Very promising. And perhaps we have some employers on the call who are interested in some of the talents. Uh, so you have Marina's contact details. It will also be shared after the webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Marina. Before we move on to our next presentation, we will have another poll for you. Um, Marvin, could you put on uh, the poll question? So the question is, what is, according to you, the most important enabler for labour market integration of refugees? Is it language and other forms of training, synergies with NGOs and the private sector, entrepreneurship support, or simply funding for labour market integration initiatives? Please stick your choice. What do you think is the most important enabler for labor market integration of refugees? You have four options and you can pick one of them. We have a bit more time for US participants to fill out the poll. And then I think we'll soon see the answers to the question. Okay, I think our time is up and here are the results. Um, so actually it seems that uh, most participants believe that language learning and training is an important enabler for labor market integration. Um, synergies with NGOs and the private sector also comes on the second place. Entrepreneurship support uh, was indicated by some of you and funding as well. So definitely the high focus on the training, the language learning, but also synergies with NGOs and private sector. And indeed talking about private sector, uh, they play a key role in labor market integration of refugees. And we're very happy to have with us uh, both Francesco Reale, Secretary General, and Monia Dardi, the Scientific Coordinator, International Projects of the ADECO Foundation for Equal Opportunities. And they'll tell us a bit more about the role of the private sector and how to render the labor market more inclusive. Francesco, welcome and over to you. So good morning and thanks for your invitation. And we are very happy to be here today with IOM and happy to share our experience and best practices on labor market integration of refugee and asylum seekers. 
But first of all, we speak about human beings, not only a legal status, but people with a known story, talented people with lots of experiences. We have heard the incredible experience and story uh, from Marina Brisa before, and uh, they bring culture and uh, new skills to organization and value to organization. I will introduce first uh, our foundation. We have um, a presentation, some slide, thanks. Uh, and then I will hand over to Bonia Dardi, the project manager and scientific coordinator for international projects uh, for a focus on our approach, our methodology and best practices in foster refugees and resettled refugees integration in the labor market. So, if we can move to the next slide, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, our foundation. ADECO Foundation in Italy is a corporate foundation, a private and independent foundation, supported by one of the most important group leaders in search and selection, training and talent solutions with a wide range of brands and activities all over the world. And we have a foundation in, uh, in Italy, in US, Spain, France, Germany, and in the headquarters of ADECO in Zurich. Our mission is to connect individuals and organizations to foster accessibility and inclusion in the workplace, helping to activate best practices and inspiring real social change. Uh, you see the purpose of the ADECO group, making the future work for everyone, and we as foundation are the everyone. So we make this possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we work on uh, diversity and inclusion. So we, 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 were, we were born in 2001. So 2021 is our anniversary. Uh, anniversary, 20 years of inclusion, 20 years of experiences and projects, and 20 years of networks because the success of our action and our project is strictly connected to our approach, our multi-stakeholder approach, where organization and private sector, public and private together, profit and non-profit, play a fundamental role in our, uh, in our uh, approach to diversity and inclusion. The main objective of the foundation is to support disadvantaged people. So you see our targets group, First of all, youngsters need people with disability, disadvantaged women, refugees, and asylum secret seekers. We are proudly partner in Italy of UNHCR, IOM. And we developed a project with JP Morgan Chase Foundation, Tent.org. And then we are working a lot on new form of poverty after the impact of COVID-19 on the labor market. So if we go to the next, um, slide, uh, it's important to, to understand how inclusion is a key factor of sustainability. So we have a new challenge for the future, for the following month, to face crises related to the pandemic on the labor market, and in particular, young people and women. Uh, young people and women are the most impacted targets by COVID-19 in terms of loss of opportunities. So making the future work for everyone is now a real social priority and the future at work will be focused on skilling and reskilling people, leaving no one behind. So the role of the private sector will be fundamental for this. Thanks again for your attention. I'm happy to introduce uh, you, Monia Dardi. Monia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco, and thank you to everyone for being here. And also good morning or good evening or good afternoon also from my side. Um, go to the next, please. Thank you. So this is our design approach, our methodology. And um, our approach is multi-level, multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary. Our networking count uh, on different MPO, NGO that have in charge people with disadvantage and obviously migrant, refugee and asylum seeker. And we implement a specific program uh, that is called system approach. So one, it's kind of hybridization of public and private partnerships. We strongly believe in this kind of hybridization. From one hand, we work with public service municipality and use the tools from HR experience also for vocational guidance, guidance and training section 
because the beneficiaries have to be ready for an active job resource and be aware about employability. And from other plans, we co-plan, it's important, outreach session about diversity inclusion with employee. So we help enterprise to enhance the value of different people, different talent, and different background. So the key words are employability, awareness, diversity, and inclusion. Next, thanks. So what we know from uh, the private sector, um, the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic is really high. You have just imagine the Italian JPD fell by 5%, nearly 5%. And uh, what we know that the scenario is completely changed. Uh, from mega trends in the labor market, we know that, for example, the index of geopolitical and economic concern is tripled. And every enterprises, as Francesco said before, talk about the needs of upskilling and reskilling the workforce, and also the increasing of G economic and platform uh, are an evidence, is an evidence. But human centrity remain really important. Uh, Fifty-eight percent are willing to really pay the enterprise for more personalized products. So we cannot be replaced by robot. So the scenario is completely different. What are our answer? Go to the next one. Thank you. The key words that we want to share, we think we are so important because give us new opportunity, new challenge, and new hopes. So um, the first one is employability, transformative resilience, Generative community based welfare and diverse inclusion mindset. Next one, thanks. First of all, employability. You know that very well is the new paradigm. Um, we talk about lifelong employability that embedding different kind of level, level of action, completely different. Employability means a set of achievement, skills, understanding, personal attributes in order to gain employment and be successful in their chosen occupation, uh, which benefits themselves, the workforce, the community, and the economy. So, um, employability means self-esteem, self-confidence, self-efficient. It's a reflection, continuous, and evaluation. So in the pictures, you can see our beneficiaries during a peer-to-peer -peer session in the vocational guidance and in profiling, but also using the employability tool. It's a new, it's a profiling tool, but also it's really good for detecting the employability. So this is the first one. We have to work for the long life employability. Next, thanks. The second key word that we want to share with you, you it's the transformation and resilience. That is coming as an important key word coming from um, JRC. And um, that means using our challenge, our stress, our to catapult us forward. So um, the transform resilience describe a living system capacity to transform itself in response to change in condition and disruption. But um, these are two pictures, Abraham and Said, two different kind of story. Abraham was in store market during the evening of the first lockdown, lockdown in, in Rome, and he has to face the entropic scenario, the assault in the market. And he used his previous experience uh, but also soft and deep skills and to face this moment. And um, Carrefour recognizes kind of skills, th this condition that you have to face this crisis and decide to stop the internship and to start a new program of career for him and now as a store manager. And the other story, it's, it's coming from Said. Said arrived in the south of Italy, you know, it's uh, the most rate of unemployment in Europe, Calabria, for example, one of the south of region. And uh, it reached the opportunity to work in, in a restaurant, but um, he has the IT bachelor degree. 
So every day um, it, it was just catching the bus and taking one hour to go to the restaurant, but he has no chance to be high. So we went together with uh, the hotspot, with the MPO, and uh, for an inclusion bus with also the geographical mobility from south to north. And the enterprise with Connect from Hire Him designed to give an opportunity for the soft skills, not only the hard skills, and for the deep skills, because they show resilience. He has to face every day, uh, every problem from the first day of arrival in Italy. So what we it's important is that transform resilience means the opportunity to turn breakdown into breakthrough. Next sense. The third key word is community-based welfare, uh, generative community-based welfare. This is the picture of uh, Famara of Uniqlo that we had in the inclusion path. And during the COVID uh, and now, he lives with senior people and helps them with buying medicine and also food shopping. So this is an example of new form of housing in Milan. It's not so uh, easy to find a, a housing or a new, a new house or some sharing. And this is a very good example of community socialization, but also new form of general pact. Next, thanks. This is the fourth. Um, keywords, diversity, the inclusion mindset for us um, that um, we took in charge nearly 9,000 people and 5,000 in inclusion. Path. So we have a lot of experience in inclusion, but also in diversity and inclusive mindset for uh, the enterprise. And this is an example, is a deliverable, is a guidelines for the inclusion path uh, for the enterprises. But from the point of view of refugee, we were together um, because uh, this is really important that the guidelines, it's written with the voice of refugee and asylum seeking person. So uh, using the community based approach. Next, please. So we went to also to finish with two best practice because we are the implementing pattern for UNSCR in Italy, and uh, there's a very, a very great uh, inclusion part that is called Welcome Working for Refugee Integration, that is social level. Um, and um, we have a lot of enterprises that are on board of, of this project. We have um, just implemented five projects, and we have this challenge for 2017. And um, what um, this is the best practice also for the networking of private and public, because we were together with UNSCR, the public sector, municipality, but also interior minister, and all the system. Uh, of Italy, the hotspot, and the enterprise for the beginning. So really an hybridization of public and private uh, areas. So the highlights that we want to share, it's employability modeling, housing, geographical mobility, but also capacity building for the operators, because we know very well what is the corporate partnership, and we can work together also with the operator that are the first person that meet and having charged the migrants, the asylum seeker, or the refugee. And this is a private public networking. Next. The other best practice that I really want to show with you is about Uniqlo. Uh, Uniqlo opened the, the first flagship in Milan, and they want to hire from the beginning migrant refugee, but also people with disability. In the same time, we organized two audit sessions about diversity for all the manager. So diversity as a DNI from the beginning, because now the refugee, but also people with disability could have career, but also change from the beginning, the climate, but also the value of the organization. Uh, at the end, next, thanks. At the end, um, we just share MPO, NGO partners, and pick the survival project because we are a key player in the labor market and strongly believe that uh, diverse talent uh, in everyone 
it's really important. So hopefully to co-plan your project with other stakeholders, but we want to strong say that inclusion is an imperative, it's not a choice, and diversity is about thinking and acting inclusively. So best practice behind Compion. So thank you very much. We are at your disposal. Thank you so much. It was extremely interesting, uh, very interesting to hear Adeko's um, approach. Um, again, participants, if you have any questions, I see some are already coming in, please uh, use the chat. Um, but what I really, you know, liked in, in, in your presentation was also this, this focus you, you place on diversity and inclusive mindset and the added value that diversity brings to, to employers, to companies. Um, you say that diversity and, and inclusive, it's, it's thinking and acting. I really like that. And I also understand that you even organize, you know, sessions to, to companies on, on questions like, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, could, could you maybe say a little bit more about how, how that goes? Because that I find it really interesting. And at the same time, I will already also convey some questions from our uh, participants. Um, there is an EU skills profile tool for third country nationals. Um, do you have any experience with that? And is it a tool that uh, you use? <laughs> So, uh, if you can already answer these questions, that that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first one about the diversity inclusion out session, I think it's really important because uh, it's our way to um, achieve the goals that the organization organization have to be um, more inclusive, but also more aware about all kind of diversity. When we mm -hmm. talk together with doesn't complain this only about the ethnic diversity but all kind of primary uh diversity so gender age uh health condition uh different kind of background so for us it's really an imperative and um it's also very useful f um theory but also practice so we're together for workshop because uh you know just to be in, 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 in empathy with the other, it could be very wonderful. So, for example, an example could be the human library. It's a social experiment about being empathy, but we can also transfer in a way for out of session in, uh, in, in enterprises with all kinds of uh, prejudice, because when we meet somebody who's different with the you know narrative approach could really fall down of the prejudice, and um, yes, but we have a lot of different experience also in theater or and when we co-plan together the outreach session, it's really important that the person it's also the key player of the diversity. For example, we use mm -hmm. a lot of lettering, but also you know storytelling from refugee uh, or. Was that have something to uh, you know to tell to the other? This is our experience, very very briefly, but it's it's quite uh, so it's quite different. Um, about the YouTube, yes, we know very well. We use in uh, another European um, project. It is called M. It's for migrants, so we used for more than eighty beneficiaries. So it's really uh, good for profiling, but not for detecting the employability. It's something different because employability, you have just already have uh, an action plan and also mm -hmm. try to understand especially what kind of uh, job title are requested for the labor market. And it's something that you can uh, use in, in a partnership with the enterprise and for the beginning. So it's really good for profiling, not for the employability in our experience. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you so much. So indeed, I understand you. you use the EU skills profiling tool as, as a first step for profiling the skills. Uh, but then, of course, the next step, working on the employability, possibly job matching, um, this, this goes a bit further indeed. Um, we'll, we'll share with participants also in the chat the link to this EU skills profiling tool in case you uh, are not aware of it. It's a tool that was indeed developed by the European Commission um, and that allows to create a skills profile um, of uh, a refugee or a migrant. Um, so it's also actually referenced in uh, the guidelines that we'll uh, present also today to you on the EPA market integration. So thank you so much uh, to colleagues from LADECO uh, Foundations. Um, I see, sorry, there is another question that just came in. If you don't mind, I will still take that question with you before we move on to the next uh, session. Um, how do you go about establishing partnerships with private enterprises? Uh, I think it is inbuilt also in, of course, you as a DECO Foundation, you, you, you have established partnerships, I assume, with, with many enterprises. Could, could you say yeah, something but, more about that? <laughs> yeah, but it's quite easy. Actually, we have a lot of strong uh, enterprise board with UNSCR, but also with TENT, um, but also a lot of enterprises in this moment um, really call us or ask us uh, to put plan a diversity inclusion program because now I think diversity inclusion is coming in this mainstreaming uh, and you know there are a lot of um, research that confirm this that you have a lot of benefits if you give and enhance the value to diversity program so I think this is the time to change something also in the private sector. So for us, it's not it's quite easy because really in this time we we get yeah, no days. We we just say that a lot of enterprise want to change something. Also for the headquarters or for our maybe yes uh, coming from US or headquarters coming from Australia that are more in advance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, in comparison with Italy, but yes, we think something is really changing. So, <laughs> okay, thank you so much, thank Monia you. Thank and you. Uh, Francesco. And thank you uh, again, we'll share with everyone, of course, also the the great presentations uh, after the webinar. Um, also asking kindly um, my colleague Rabab to put in the link to the EU skills profile tool in the chat so that uh, all of you can also have a look at that. Um, I think we're now going to have a last poll, um, a last set of questions to you as uh, participants. What do you think are the biggest challenge for the integration of refugees in the labor market? Is it matching refugee skills with local job opportunities, recognition of qualifications and previous experience, discrimination and xenophobia, or legal and administrative barriers? What do you think are the biggest challenges? Uh, let us know what you think. Um, of course, some of our presenters already mentioned some. Uh, but we're also eager to hear from you, the participants, what do you perceive as being the biggest challenges? So you have a bit more time, please uh, fill in our poll. Okay, time is up. Let's see the answers. Um, okay, it's a bit mixed, I see here, but definitely a lot of people looked at recognition of qualifications as being a key uh, challenge uh, more than any of the others. Uh, so indeed, understandably, um, it is not um, easy, but this is also a work in progress. Uh, we know it's also something uh, the Commission is looking into. So hopefully some of these challenges uh, can be addressed. I think we are now ready to move on to the last part of our webinar. 
And in this part, we are going to launch the guidelines that we have produced, the newest commit publication. And these are practical guidelines to support the labor market integration of refugees in the EU. It was uh, produced together with uh, ADECO Foundation as part of the COMMIT project. And these are guidelines for practitioners, meaning anyone who works with resettled refugees could be pre-departure orientation trainings, could be maybe uh, actors working in reception centers or, or volunteer mentors. Uh, basically, we hope these guidelines you know, will give practical advice uh, to anyone who's supporting uh, resettled refugees in the process of finding a job. So I'm happy to hand over to Anna Justiniana. Anna is the project manager of the COMMIT project and will explain to us what these guidelines are about. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Gaeta, and thank you all participants for being so numerous today. And thank you very much for the previous presenters who gave us uh, a very uh, broad picture of uh, labor market integration, the challenges embedded and, and the opportunities that are also there. So, um, as Gaeta was saying, we are here today also to present uh, one of the last tools developed by the COMMIT project. Uh, as she said, this is a joint venture between ADECO and, and IOM. Um, I'm sure you will soon receive in the chat the um, address where you can uh, look at the, um, at the guidelines for uh, directly. There is a, an English version so far, but very soon you will also find a Croatian version, an Italian version, a Portuguese and Spanish version. So, this uh, toolkit is meant to be a very, very concrete tool at the disposal uh, of the uh, practitioners, as Gesta was saying, that from pre-departure to post-arrival um, work hand in hand with uh, um, resettled refugees. Um, what are we talking about? So we uh, have this uh, um, uh, guidelines that is divided into two main sections. The first section that is giving uh, a more broader um, view of uh, resettlement and uh, um, labor market integration of resettled refugees in Europe, uh, looking mainly at the many barriers that uh, um, they find and um, the uh, addressee of these uh, uh, guidelines are indeed practitioners, PDO trainers, social workers, community mentors, public and, and private service providers, as has been mentioned uh, many times this morning. And why have we decided to um, focus on this uh, aspect? We all know that uh, uh, for refugees, just as for anyone else, to get a job is uh, is a fundamental part of our uh, life. And to find a job that matches to the extent possible one's profile is even more difficult. Uh, we know this is not easy, more so uh, for refugees who encounter a huge number of barriers. Uh, barriers of um, different natures that uh, are also interlinked uh, uh, between them institutional or contextual uh, difficult uh, policies to abide by, um, complex administrative procedures to follow, the structure of the labor market in the resettlement countries itself. So there are a number of uh, contextual barriers that uh, um, refugees have, uh, have to encounter. There are also um, social um, barriers, the ones that were mentioned, uh, earlier by ADECO, um, perhaps uh, employers are not uh, ready to employ uh, diverse, uh, uh, to, to embed diversity into their um, uh, labor market. Uh, there are also individual uh, issues and problems. Uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, language skills or lack of uh, the skills uh, um, that match with the jobs available in a, in a given uh, labor market. So, how have we uh, built this uh, this uh, these guidelines, and how these guidelines uh, are meant to reach uh, their objective? Uh, well, 
in, in practice, you will see that uh, um, the different discussions that we heard this morning are somehow summarized in this uh, in these guidelines. Uh, what they aim at is to provide practical support to resettled refugees to define and implement their employment objectives to identify the schemes, but also to match the, their skills with the available options in a given labor market and to um, set up and implement the job seeking strategy. Labor market integration support should be provided throughout the different phases of the resettlement continuum, starting from pre-departure. As uh, Marina explained to us, there is uh, a lot to do at pre-departure phase, um, helping uh, refugees to develop realistic expectations for what they can expect when they arrive in the country of resettlement. Um, through pre departure skill profiling, as many participants have also uh, been uh, raising the attention on. Um, apart from the EU skill uh, uh, profiling tool, we can also um, perhaps uh, um, share with you the experience of the LinkedIn project. I'm sure you will find uh, at the same uh, uh, address of our regional office this instrument. Um, through language training before departure to ease transition and facilitate labor market integration and all of this uh, um, pre-departure uh, support will have to be linked with post-arrival uh, stage. Uh, this is in fact the main principle of the commit project linking uh, pre-departure and post-arrival support so that this is uh, uh, clearly supporting the uh, resettlement continuum, but it's also linking up uh, uh, with the integration continuum um, to uh, to make possible a better integration prospects. So to uh, link with the post arrival stage when uh, um, a number of uh, um, support services provided both by uh, public and private actors will be available to refugees from language training to uh, vocational training and, and uh, uh, support by um, community mentors. Uh, uh, once again, the role of the community, I think, has been uh, um, underlined multiple times by the presentations uh, uh, earlier this morning. So from the discussion today, it clearly appears that a refugee integration can only be the result of a multi-layered approach, international, national, local level, but also public and private um, networking. So we all have a role to play uh, to make integration of resettled refugees uh, possible. And I think uh, today's experience is, uh, is a good uh, example of this, uh, of this path. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Anna. And uh, indeed, you will also find now in the chat the link to this new publication, this new guideline. So please do uh, have a look at the publication. You will find a lot of uh, information or some practical tools uh, that exist and that can help you in supporting refugees, labor market integration, such as the skills profile tool, which is now also having the link um, in the chat. So um, we hope that uh, this webinar was uh, interesting. It was definitely interesting uh, for me. I really enjoyed, you know, uh, the presentations, the questions, the interactions. So, a very warm thank you to all the presenters, um, Marina from TBB, uh, Monia Francesco from ADECO, Anna from IOM. Great presentations. I see also some participants ask if they can receive the slides. Yes, uh, you will receive after the webinar um, an email from us. Um, with the presentations and also the link to the uh, publication. So I see it's time for us uh, to close now. Um, before I do, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up that uh, we will also soon be holding the commit 
final event uh, because the commit project uh, will be coming to an end. Um, but there's still a lot uh, that we want to share um, with you in the final event. Um, so all of you will also receive an invitation for the commit final event, which will take place on the 29th of April. So please uh, do save the date and we hope to see all of you again in the commit final event uh, on the 29th of April. Thank you very much everyone and enjoy the rest of this very nice and sunny day. See you soon and goodbye.